Hello YouTube and happy Halloween. I uh, hope everybody has a you know happy and safe Halloween and that anyone who goes out trick-or-treating gets lots and lots of treats. Because today is Halloween I wanted to do something that was sort of a horror themed video which is I know a bit of a cliche when it comes to this time of year but it's something that I really haven't done a whole lot of. Uh, I was thinking about different ways that I could do these videos. I could talk about you know maybe the uh, Heroes of Horror uh, supplement for 3.5 Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, I could talk about some of the uh, Cthulhu-based uh, role-playing game stuff that I have for the D20 system. But I thought I would do it based off of a game, a board game in fact. And one of my favorite purchases, even though I haven't had a chance to really get a lot of use out of it, and that would be the Dungeons & Dragons Cooperative Board Game System Adventure Castle Ravenloft. So this is a dungeon exploration game based off of the Ravenloft uh, property. Uh, throughout it, you basically the group of players will go exploring the catacombs beneath Castle Ravenloft uh, for any number of different reasons. The game is broken up into several different scenarios, all with their own stories, victory conditions, and defeat conditions. As the players explore, they'll battle monsters, encounter um, some perilous events, and potentially even some dangerous villains. So what I'd like to do is just sort of open up the box, show you guys what's inside, and explain the basics of how to play. All right, so here's a little overview of all the things that come in the uh, the box itself. So we've got our rule book as well as our adventure book that contains all the different scenarios that the players can go through. Uh, you've got cards for each of the player characters uh, to, in, to go over their abilities, as well as the player character tiles themselves or cards themselves, and the player character miniatures, which I'll show off in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, in addition, there are th several decks of cards, including monster, treasure, and encounter cards. Uh, there are also five healing surge tokens provided, although most scenarios only have you using two in your pool. Uh, there are hit point counters, including just uh, ones for single points of damage, uh, ones for five points if you've taken that much, and there's even some for the tougher monsters that have uh, more than one hit point. Uh, in addition, we've got our tiles that we use to create the dungeon as we go. We have our start tile, uh, as well as just some condition markers, several of, uh, of each of these, uh, which are mobilized, which means that speed, character speed is uh, reduced to zero. And we've also got uh, slowed, which reduced their speed to two, with certain monsters attacks dealing these types of uh, conditions. Uh, there's also some encounter tiles as well, uh, which come in the form of traps, or some of the player character abilities actually uh, create things that you would place down uh, on the board itself. Now there are several other smaller uh, tokens that come with this game, uh, including some like item ones, some treasure ones, some monster ones, uh, some time ones for any time sensitive uh, adventures. But there's just so many different types of those, and most of them are specific to only a single uh, of the adventures that you can go through, that I'm not really going to show them off uh, in this video. Uh, in addition, we've also got our villain tiles, which are very similar to the player characters. Uh, they are double-sided as well, so there are six uh, different villains on these three tiles here, as well as one large-sized uh, villain card. Uh, so we have here Count Strahd von Zarevich, as well as Gravestorm of Dracolich. So, uh, in addition to that, there are a bunch of miniatures included in this as well. And that's one of the things about this game, that, uh, or these board games, that I really failed to mention in my uh, video on where to get miniatures from. The main reason was that I thought that these games were harder to find than they, no than they necessarily are. Uh, I'm still finding these listed on uh, Amazon and other sites for a price that's pretty close to what the original retail was. So these do have quite a few different miniatures in them. So included in this box are four each of the following. So you've got a gargoyle, miniature, a zombie, A skeleton, which is actually um, put inside of a plastic holder 
unlike uh, the skeletons that came in the original D&D miniatures game. And I should mention that most of these, if not all of these, are recast uh, from the D&D minis game molds. But the, the skeletons that came in like this in the miniatures game were notorious for being like bent over, like most of them were leaning forward. Um, so this actually keeps them from doing that, which is actually pretty cool, and I wish that the actual miniatures would have come like that. Uh, there are also uh, four ghouls. Four wolves. Didn't mean to bump the camera there. Four kobolds. Four rat swarms, and I don't know how well the uh, little rats are gonna necessarily show up there. But it does say rat swarm on the base. Four spiders. Four wraiths. And these are in sort of like a blue translucent plastic, which is pretty cool. And then finally, there are four of these blazing skeletons. Now this one, it's kind of a mess to try to see the skeleton inside because it's supposed to be wreathed in flames. But you can see like the leg bone there, you can sort of see the skull and the rib cage. Uh, but unless you're looking kind of closely at it, it is clutching a fireball there in its hands. It is kind of hard to make out. So this is one of the more confusing looking miniatures, but if you look carefully enough, you can see like the, the skull and the skeletal features. So there are four of each of those, which again makes them, you know, great additions to your miniatures collection if you want monsters of that kind. But it also includes the miniatures for the villains themselves. So let's just have a quick look at those as well. Uh, we'll start with the, uh, the smaller ones. So up first, uh, we have Clack, the Kobold Sorcerer. Uh, we've got our werewolf. Uh, a howling hag. You see there, she's definitely howling. As well as our uh, vampire, who is also uh, the miniature that you use for Strahd. So there are scenarios where you go off against a uh, just a weaker vampire, you use this miniature, but you also use this for Count Strahd himself. So it even says on the bottom, Count Strahd uh, with a little comma vampire. So that one's multi-purpose. There's also a Flesh Golem, which looks really cool. A Zombie Dragon, which uses the zombie white dragon from the D&D miniatures game, which was the bane of my existence when we would play the actual miniatures game, just because it would always go up against my beholder, and my beholder was pretty well useless against it. But there's that. And then finally, we have our Dracolich. So each of these games also comes with a figure on a huge base. This is Gravestorm. The Dracolich. Now again, like I said, these were all recast from the original D&D miniatures game. So, uh, for comparison, I do have the actual uh, Dracolich miniature. Just so you can kind of see that they are the exact same, only unpainted. And of course, the, uh, the type of dragon this is based off of would have been a blue dragon. But that's just again to show that these are recast from uh, the miniatures games themselves. So those are the monsters, but there are also our heroes. So we have here the first hero is Arjan, the Dragonborn Fighter. Then we've got Cat. I get it to focus here. Cat, the Human Rogue. Sword's a little bent, unfortunately, but that's one of the byproducts of these plastic miniatures. There is uh, Emerald, 
the Eladrin wizard. You can see he's getting ready to cast what looks like a fireball there. And then we have uh, Thorgrim, the dwarf cleric. And finally, we have Alyssa, the human rogue. So the way that this game is played is it's sort of a dungeon exploration or uh, tile laying game. So you build the dungeon as you go based off of the stack of tiles. Uh, the game itself is also broken down into uh, several phases, which you can see here on this sequence of play card. So there's the hero phase, the exploration phase, and the villain phase. And you go through them in that order. Uh, the game also comes with a d20 uh, for you know attack rolls and things of that nature. Uh, so for the, if you have multiple players in the game at the same time, you just have them all roll to see who goes first. And then it goes around the table in a clockwise fashion. Each player selects one of the characters available. So in this case, I'm just going to select our Dragonborn Fighter. So if we look at his card here, it gives a little bit of information saying that you are a mighty warrior, Born to a clan of draconic humanoids, you have never lost a battle, and you have come to drive evil out of the ruins of Castle Ravenloft. We have our statistics here. So, for example, he's got a 17 armor class, 10 hit points, a speed of 5, and a healing surge value of 5. He also has the defender ability, so you protect your friends while another... Or sorry, it says you protect your friends. While another hero is on the same tile as you, he or she gains a plus 1 bonus to your armor class. So if you travel with uh, other characters or if you have other players on the same tile as you, uh, then you can increase one of their armor classes by one. Uh, it says you, for powers you also use the following powers. So you automatically get the Dragon's Breath card, which you can see here. Uh, it attacks, uh, so it does not count as an attack, so this is sort of like a free action almost. Uh, it, the attack you roll d20 at plus 4 and it deals uh, 1 damage. And this is a daily ability so uh, it says in the bottom you flip it over when you use the ability. Uh, you also start with 1 fighter utility power, 2 at will powers, and 1 daily power. So, each of the uh, characters will have several different cards to choose from. So, if we look at our utility first, there are three different ones. We have Unstoppable, which allows you to regain two hit points. Uh, Bodyguard, which uses this power when a monster hits another hero within one tile of you. It says the attack misses and you swap positions with the hero that was attacked. Uh, and then you have Get Over There. So you choose a... Um, you use this instead of moving, choose a monster within two tiles of you. Place your hero adjacent to that monster. So you can basically um, surge your way towards this, this creature. Um, if I were to choose, if I was playing, say I was playing solo, I would probably take Unstoppable to let me regain two hit points. So I have that in addition to my Dragon's Breath. Next I get to choose two different at will abilities. So these I can use an unlimited number of times. They don't flip over once they're used. There's Cleave, which is, uh, you know, attack one adjacent monster. If I hit, choose a mon another monster on your tile and move adjacent to it and that monster takes one damage so that's good if you're uh, potentially swarmed. Uh, there's Trapping Strike which, uh, oh sorry, this attacks at plus six bonus for one damage. This attacks at plus eight uh, for one damage and says choose one monster within one tile of you, place that monster adjacent to your hero and attack it. And then finally there's Tide of Iron uh, which is also a plus eight attack. Uh, attack one adjacent monster. If you hit, place that monster if it isn't destroyed on a tile within one tile of you and you can move to any square on your tile. So it's a way of just basically moving a monster away if it's not defeated and you can move anywhere on the particular tile that you're standing on. Meaning that you can move to an edge, you can move to uh, anywhere that you want basically. So if I were to choose, um, I think I would take the uh, Tide of Iron and Cleave just because Cleave can deal with multiple opponents and this one can also manipulate how they are on the board. So, I would choose these two in addition to my other abilities. And then finally, there are the one daily power that I can choose from. So, uh, there's Precise Strike, which is uh, plus 11 for two damage. And the, the thing that's great about this is that if you miss, you don't flip the card over. 
So you actually, if you screw up the roll, then you can keep trying to use this ability until you actually hit. Uh, there is Come and Get It, which attacks at plus six from one. You choose one tile within a tile of you. Place each monster on that tile adjacent to your hero and then attack each adjacent monster. Uh, so that can be pretty good at crowd control, especially if they're all smaller uh, things with just one hit point each. And then there is Brute Strike. Uh, so attack one adjacent monster. If you miss, do not flip this a card over. Uh, it attacks at plus five for four. So this works best if you're going up against one of the villains, for example. Um, because most of the monsters only have one or two hit points, so dealing four damage is going to be wasted on them. But if you're going into a scenario where you know you're facing off against one of the uh, villains, like for example the Dracolich, then this is the one that you'd want to take. If you're playing a standard scenario, then I would probably end up taking the Precise Strike, just so that it's something that you can keep trying uh, even if you miss. So I kind of like that one. So these are the powers that I would choose personally. Now if it's your first time playing and you don't know which abilities are the best to use in any given situation, the adventure book does actually list which ones that you should take. So for example, um, it says that you, if you're playing this for the first time, you use Dragon's Breath. That's actually kind of funny because they're the, the ones that I actually chose. But Dragon's Breath, Cleave, Tide of Iron, Precise Strike, and Unstoppable. So I actually ended up choosing the ones that the game would recommend, uh, which is actually kind of funny because I didn't look that up ahead of time. But uh, there you go. Now if you want, you can also swap out other uh, abilities as well. So that's your, your hero. So on your hero phase, let's just place our hero on our starting tile, which we have here. So on the hero phase, it says that you can do the following. Uh, so for example, Good focus says if you have zero hit points, you use a healing surge token if one is available. Uh, now we're starting off, so we don't have any wounds or anything on us, so we're okay there. Uh, so then the options are move and then make an attack, attack and then move, or make two moves. So in this case, the player characters, the heroes, move a number of squares on the tile equal to their speed. So let's just bring this down a little bit since I've already shown off the the tokens and tiles and things of that nature. So let's just bring this down so we got a little bit more uh, room to work with and it's a little easier to see what's going on. So we, we're going to end up moving. Uh, there's no monsters usually placed on the starting tiles. Uh, that's not necessarily true for every scenario, uh, but for most scenarios the starting tile is clear of any enemies. So I can move up to five squares. So let's just go one, two, three, four. So let's just move up here. Now, at this point, uh, I can't move any further because there's no tile played. There's no enemies to fight, so I don't make any attacks. So I would then move on to the exploration phase. And on the exploration phase, uh, it says if your hero occupies a square adjacent to an unexplored edge, which is just basically any edge that's open like this and doesn't have a tile placed on it, uh, it says draw a dungeon tile and place it with its triangle adjacent to the unexplored edge and then draw a monster card and place it on the new tile. So, going to our dungeon tile stack, we take our first uh, tile, we flip it over, and you see we've got the triangle here. This points to the edge that you have to place it on. So, for example, uh, you place it like so. Now, the white triangles indicate that nothing happens beyond a monster being placed down. So we'll go to our putting our monster on there so we draw a kobold skirmisher so let's place uh, the kobold and you place them on these little skull piles uh, if you place multiple monsters at the same time on the same tile then you basically just kind of go around uh, and try to keep them as close to the skull pile as possible <coughs> unlike heroes however uh, the monsters move in a particular pattern, which we'll get to right now because the next thing that we go on to is now that our exploration phase is done, we move on to our villain phase. So, uh, we'll skip number one because we haven't done that yet, and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, we'll skip number two uh, because, again, we aren't using a villain. And then we go to number three. So it says activate each monster and trap you control in the order that you drew them. So. We only have the one monster, we have the Kobold Skirmisher. 
So we'll go to our attacks and just. Oh. So for the attacks, we just look at the creature card and we follow its tactics in the order from top to bottom based off of which ones are available to us. We also look at the monster stats here. So the kobold has 13 armor class, one hit point. It attacks at plus nine for one damage and it's worth one experience point, which I'll explain a little bit later on what you can do with experience points. Uh, so we move to our villain phase now. Uh, we don't have any encounter cards that we have to play as of yet. Uh, so we'll place down our monster, or we'll play our monster uh, for the turn. So uh, it says if the kobold is within one tile of a hero, it attacks the closest hero with a javelin. So it doesn't actually move in this case. Otherwise it moves one tile towards the closest hero. So the, uh, the rule of thumb generally for these is that if they move, uh, the monsters move based off a number of tiles instead of squares, which is why they're a little bit different than the player characters. Uh, in general, it's best to, if you can, have them move, uh, if they're moving from tile to tile, uh, I would recommend moving them to the skull piles, um, which it just makes it sort of easier to place them each turn. Now in this case, it's within one tile, <coughs> so it's going to attack us. So it attacks at plus nine. Uh, my fighter's armor class is uh, 17. So it gets a total of 15, which misses. So I got six on the dice, uh, plus nine is 15, which misses. So we'll go to our next, oh, and you should be there, sorry. Uh, so we will now go to our next turn. So we'll have our hero uh, move here, so that he's on an unexplored edge, and then we will have him attack. Now at this point, I'm just going to use one of my regular uh, attacks because it only has a 13 armor class. I'm not particularly worried about it. So, in this case, I will use Tide of Iron just because it has the highest bonus to hit. And that is a natural 20. So, there's a few things that can happen on a natural 20 when you're making an attack roll. So, number one, the Kobold takes damage and dies. So, he dies. <coughs> We move this card into the experience pile, and whenever you defeat a creature, you end up drawing a treasure card. So we go to our treasure stack, and we draw a card. In this case, we draw holy water. Uh, it's also important to note, and it was something that I ended up missing uh, earlier, is that you also start the game with one of these treasure cards as well. Uh, so having drawn that earlier, I would have started with a Lucky Charm, which is another item. So it says you can use this item after any die roll to reroll the dice and then you discard uh, the card afterwards. So I would have started with Lucky Charm and now I've got Holy Water, uh, which is another discard after using it. So you choose one undead monster within one tile of you and it takes one damage automatically, no attack rolls necessary. Uh, in addition to the magic items that you can find, you can also uncover fortune cards, which are basically instantaneous effects that you can end up using. Uh, so for example, we've got uh, we've got a fortune called Shake It Off. Uh, and what this says is choose one hero, that hero can end one condition affecting him or her. So let's just say our hero was slowed if I end up killing a monster and gaining this fortune, I can immediately discard this instead of having to wait until the end of my next hero phase. So uh, that can come in pretty handy. There are some uh, conditions, not necessarily in this game, but there are some conditions that you actually have to make dice rolls to see if you can end them. So having something like this in them would be uh, pretty useful as well. And those are things that go off immediately. If when choosing your starting item, you end up uh, gaining a, or overturning one of the fortune cards, you simply set it aside and keep drawing until you get an item and then once you're done you just reshuffle the deck. <coughs> so, now with our experience pile there are several different things that we can do and with a natural 20 on there one of the things that you can actually end up doing is if you roll a natural 20 on an attack roll and let's just say this isn't the first thing that we've killed, let's just say we've also had a gargoyle and a were or sorry, just a regular wolf killed. If you have five experience points in your pile and you roll a natural 20 on an attack roll, 
you can discard these, so you can remove them from the experience pile, and you can flip your character over to second level. So at second level, for example, your armor class goes from 17 to 18, you gain two more hit points, your speed stays the same, and your healing surge value goes from 5 to 6. You still maintain the defender ability, uh, but you also gain the critical hit. So if you roll another natural 20 later, you deal an extra damage. You also get to choose an additional uh, daily ability. So, why don't we pick, uh, just for the sake of having something again that uh, we don't waste if we miss on, let's just take the Brute Strike one and add that to our list of abilities. So now we are a second level character. Now, We've moved on, we've defeated our monster, and we are on an unexplored edge, so let's move to our next exploration phase. So here we draw a tile with a black triangle on it. So with this one, uh, we still go ahead and draw our monster, which ends up being another kobold skirmisher. So we place our kobold on there, and then we move on to our villain phase. Now remember, with our villain phase, now we have to look at step one. So step one says that if you didn't place a tile during your exploration phase, or if you placed a tile with a black triangle, you draw an encounter card. So, let's just go ahead and draw an encounter. So here we have a trap. So this was a crossbow turret. So we would find its corresponding trap card. Now I don't have that one out. So, let's just see if I can find the one that I actually have the tile for, which was actually the very next card, so that's perfect. So, what we have is an alarm. So this is a trap. We take our alarm square. We just place it on that tile so that we know that it's there. So it says, place, uh, place an alarm marker on the, oh, on the active hero's tile. So it would go on the one that we're currently on. Uh, if that tile already has a marker, discard this card and draw another encounter card. So let's just say that someone else moved to that tile, had to draw an encounter card, and got the crossbow turret. If the alarm's still on there, you would disregard it and draw another card. So the effect of this says, uh, trigger the trap during your villain phase. Place a new monster on the unexplored edge closest to the alarm marker. So you would just basically keep placing uh, monsters there. And it says, instead of attacking, if a hero uh, on the tile with a, uh, with a trap can try to disable it by rolling d20 and getting a 10 or higher. So that would go off uh, on your villain phase, so we'd end up placing another monster on there. Let's actually just place, um, what's the next one that we would have drawn? So we'd place a blazing skeleton on there during our villain phase. And then we would move to our attacks, so they would go through and do their attacks, and we would continue until we reached the goal of the scenario. Uh, most scenarios have you looking to uncover a particular dungeon tile, and when you do that, it automatically um, it starts the sort of the win condition. Uh, for example, the second scenario in the game has you trying to find the Draculich's Flactory and destroy it. Uh, so you have to uncover the uh, you have to uncover a particular uh, tile. In this case you would look for the laboratory tile, which is in this stack of tiles here, and they're usually placed with, between the uh, 8th and 12th card or stack in the pile. So basically, it means that you're only going to be drawing about, you know, usually about a dozen tiles or so before you get to your win condition. Um, now, for the, each of these different scenarios, again, explains how you win. Uh, so for some of them, you're trying to defeat a specific monster, trying to locate a particular item or artifact, or you're simply trying to escape the, to the dungeon, which is the purpose of the single player uh, scenario, adventure number one, uh, Escape the Tomb, which is something that I'm actually going to do as a separate video where I go through and actually show the gameplay. So that's sort of the basic gameplay. Uh, the only other things that I want to talk about is go into a little bit more detail about the encounter cards themselves because there are multiple versions of them. So with the alarm one, for example, we uh, had seen one of the trap cards that you can possibly get, but there are other types of um, encounter cards as well, uh, each of which is color coded. So for example, we have events. Uh, in this case, we have Strahd's Whispers. Uh, place the active hero adjacent to the next closest hero. 
the active hero then attacks with an at-will power. So a lot of these involve perhaps moving player characters around. Uh, some could involve placing extra monsters on tiles kind of far away or close. Uh, so there's lots of different things that they can do. Some of these involve attacks, but they're usually the player characters in this, like in this situation, attacking one another. Uh, so they can happen like that. Uh, some also allow you to place tiles from the bottom of the tile stack uh, on a, one of the unexplored edges and uh, just to make the dungeon a little bit longer to, to simulate basically getting lost uh, type of thing. Then there's at uh, attack events. In this case we have Choking Fog. So this one, uh, attack each hero on the active hero's tile. It does plus six for the attack roll and it does two damage but even if you miss you still take a damage. These are kind of the worst ones to get just because um, they usually involve uh, making attacks against multiple uh, players and they usually end up dealing damage regardless. So these are some of the worst ones to get. Uh, in this case, whoever ends up drawing the, the card would be the person making the various rolls. And then there are environment uh, cards. So in this case we have Blood Fog. Uh, so you can only have one environment card in play at a time. So, uh, you keep this one in play until another environment card is drawn. Now, unlike the trap ones, which you would uh, disregard and draw another card until you got something that was not a trap, with environment cards, you would replace the previous one with the most recent one drawn. So, if I drew another environment card, this would go away and the next environment card would take effect. So, uh, in this one, it says, whenever a hero or monster attacks and rolls a natural 17 or higher, the target of the attack takes one additional damage. So this is something that can be beneficial, but it can also be very detrimental uh, to the player characters as well. So that is something to be uh, careful of. And those are the different types of events. As far as uh, just some other miscellaneous things that I want to discuss, of course there is the, uh, the damage markers. So there are some monsters, for example, that have more than one health. So we've got our Blazing Skeleton has two health. So let's just say our fighter attacks the Blazing Skeleton and hits. Uh, but only deals one damage to it. What we, what we would then do is take our damage marker and place it on the side of the base of the wounded creature. In the event that multiple players have drawn the same monster, things get a little bit more uh, harrowing for the players. So if two players, for example, had, had drawn the Kobold Skirmisher, Whenever you go to, whenever one of those players goes to their villain phase and activates monsters, you would activate any monsters that share the same name. So rather than trying to maintain the idea of which monster belongs to which player, if multiple players have Kobold Skirmishers, whenever you go to move, activate your monsters, you would activate all the Kobold Skirmishers that are on the table at the time, and they would go through and perform their tactics. So if two players in a row have Kobold Skirmishers, and they're not dealt with, then when player one goes, he activates both of the kobolds, and when player two goes, he would activate both of the kobolds. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, the experience pile, which I had mentioned earlier, is something that is a shared resource that the entire party can use. So unlike activating monsters, where you would keep the monsters uh, next to all of your player, your character stuff, uh, and activate them separately. The experience pile is something that is shared amongst everyone. Now I had mentioned that there were uh, multiple uses of the experience pile. The first one is of course the ability to level your character up. Uh, if you roll a natural 20 or if you find the fortune card level up which allows you to spend five experience uh, to gain second level. However, if you want to, uh, for example, avoid uh, one of the encounters that comes up. So let's just say uh, all the players are pretty beat up and the encounter card that would be drawn is the Choking Fog encounter that attacks everyone on a particular tile and de de deals a minimum of one damage to each of those players. You can actually spend five experience points to prevent the encounter card from occurring. And that is sort of important because it's sort of a way of giving you a bit of a reprieve, especially if things are kind of rough. Uh, now, like I said, the individual scenarios, of which I believe there are 13 of in this particular uh, in this particular book. Oh. Yeah, there are 13 different scenarios. Each scenario has their own victory conditions, as well as losing conditions. But for the most part, the losing conditions tend to be 
pretty much the same, which is if one of your player characters is reduced to zero hit points, uh, so for example, if you've taken uh, a whole bunch of damage, so let's just go back to our other side here. Let's just say we're level one and uh, we've taken 10 points of damage. Uh, I don't have an extra one, so let's just put this on here for now because I don't really want to go back and fish out just one more of these. But let's just say we've taken 10 damage and we don't have any healing surges left. So most scenarios only allow the entire group to share uh, two healing surges and based off of whoever needs them first type of thing. So let's just say that there's no healing surges left and you comes to that player's turn, they're not healed by any of the other characters, then that player character is considered to be dead and if one player dies in this game, then by the default rules, everyone loses. So where it's a cooperative game, you either win together or you lose together. And that's something that is important to know. Uh, and that's basically how you play uh, these particular games. Uh, so this was Castle Ravenloft. There are several others. Uh, I have the next two in the series that have come out being Wrath of Shardalon and Legend of Dritz. And overall, um, I actually kind of like these games. Now what I'm going to do is I did make up a few house rules and I'll give sort of my overall thoughts on the game here in a moment. But I just wanted you to see sort of the basics of how you place the tiles, how you interact with the monsters, uh, the encounter cards, uh, things of that nature. Uh, one last thing is if you're going up against a villain in one of your scenarios, the villain activates on every single player's villain phase. If you recall, on the order of a sequence of play card here, step number two is if a villain is in play, activate it. So that happens if you're going up against a villain, they get to activate quite a bit and they can be pretty deadly. Uh, so that's, like I said, it's just the basics of the game. So now what I want to do is sort of give my overall thoughts as well as a few suggestions that I had for kind of improving the way that the game plays. So that was my look at Castle Ravenloft, the very first in the D&D cooperative adventure game system. And I gotta be honest, I love these games. Uh, I think they're great, they're a lot of fun, and as somebody who's not really a competitive person, I think it comes from being a dungeon master and just being more focused on wanting to get the players through my stories. Uh, I just don't feel like I'm a competitive player. So I love the cooperative aspect of the game. Uh, but I can see how, and I've had some players that have said this in the past when they play the game, that they're not a huge fan of the way that the cooperative system works. Mainly in that it's way too easy for the player characters to lose based off the fact that healing is not the most abundant thing. Monsters generally get to attack first before the player characters get a chance to do anything, and most of the scenarios are lost if a single player ends up dying. Uh, which can again affect the way that a lot of the players kind of feel about the game. So there are a few different ways that we've actually ended up trying this in the past. Uh, I created a few house rules uh, that I typed off and printed off, as well as trying the idea of having just the two healing surges and letting each of the player characters um, do the scenario through, uh, but also have the added bonus of having to escape the dungeon afterwards. Um, so that way there are some players that can quote unquote win uh, the game sort of thing whereas some of the player characters who may end up dying would be considered uh, to have lost the game. And that makes some of the more uh, competitive players feel a bit better about going through uh, the game. Uh, another one of the things that I've done is allowed each player character to have their own healing surge that they have in reserve. The game gives you five tokens but most scenarios only allow two of them to ever be used. So since there's five of them and five player characters, uh, I usually allow each character to have their own healing surge and then go by the rule that um, if a character dies, um, he still, uh, the rest of the group can still continue and uh, go through and try to defeat the scenario and escape the dungeon. <clears throat> now, in general, once they try to make their way out the dungeon, uh, a few things have to occur, like for example, uh, the entrance tile would be populated by monsters, uh, which you'd have to defeat in order to get past, sort of thing. Um, but once you defeat those monsters, then if you get to the stairs, you're considered to have escaped and won the scenario, which is something that's helped out quite a bit. Uh, there's some encounters, or some scenarios, which also have you drawing an encounter card every turn after the, um, the end game scenario starts. 
Um, I actually, again, like the way that the scenarios are presented. Each is sort of like their own particular story. There's flavor text at the beginning of them, um, and there's flavor text once you uncover whatever tile it is you need to start the end game, uh, which is really great. Uh, the scenarios themselves are also very loosely connected, but they do end up telling a story with scenarios 12 and 13 both being about the hunt for Strahd. Uh, so, for example, uh, you would actually uh, encounter him in scenario 12, but you don't actually end up defeating him. You have to find his, uh, his coffin in scenario 13 and defeat him there once and for all, which is pretty cool. Uh, the one downside is that, again, there's not much interconnecting other than those two scenarios, even though you're constantly going back into the dungeon to explore. Um, the other unfortunate thing is that if your characters, they basically reset every time you start another scenario, meaning that if you were second level, uh, at the end of the first time you play, then you end up going back to first level afterwards. Now it is worth noting that first level uh, heroes in these games don't mean first level characters. I know it's that the way that you would perceive it, but it's not. Uh, for example, the Elven Wizard has um, Fireball as an ability that he can choose as a first level character. It just basically means that you don't have the added benefits of, you know, whatever the second level version is. So you're still a pretty powerful character considering that you have, you know, usually six to ten hit points, whereas the rest of the monsters only have like one or two. So just, again, certain things to keep in mind. As far as um, the uh, lethality of the game, though, it is a very difficult game to win just based off the fact that, again, A, monsters will always get to activate prior to a, a hero being able to deal with them, and B, the encounter cards can be quite deadly. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned when reading the uh, sequence of play cards is that if you don't end up placing a tile uh, on your turn, you automatically have to draw an encounter card, which has been brutal in the past, uh, especially if you're playing the cleric or the healer, and you've got somebody that's down, you don't have any healing surges left, so you move on to their tile, in order to heal them. Now you have to be adjacent to them. Well, actually, I think you just have to be on the same tile. But you, let's just say you don't have enough movement to get to an unexplored edge, or worse, there's no unexplored edge on there. Meaning that you move there, you use your ability to heal them, to get them back up so that you're not going to lose the game when it's their turn because you don't have any healing surges left, and you end up drawing a event card or an event card that has you attacking everybody on that tile and dealing at least one point of damage, which is what you just healed them for, meaning that it was all for nothing. And that can be extremely frustrating. Uh, traps can also be kind of difficult as well because they activate anytime somebody's on their uh, on the dungeon tile with their uh, token on it. Uh, so the, the house rules that I came up with uh, that I try to use when playing, especially Castle Ravenloft, is in the event that you don't place a dungeon tile on your hero phase, you roll a d20 to determine if there's an encounter or not. Now, there's several different ways to resolve uh, the d20 roll. Because this came out back in the days of 4th edition, I used the 4th edition approach, which was usually uh, even or odd. Um, so, for example, certain events, like certain monsters in the role-playing game, if you hit them, uh, you, you'd have to roll a d20. If you got an even number, then this would happen. Or if you got an odd number, then nothing would happen, or so on and so forth. So I had used it that if you roll, uh, in, if it's an even number, there's no encounter, and if it's an odd number, there is an encounter. Now you can also do like 1 through 10 and 11 through 20. There's different ways that you can do it. I just chose the 4th edition method, which was even or odd at the time. Uh, there's also, uh, when it comes to traps, one of the player characters, as I had shown off, is a rogue. So, to make rogues feel like rogues, rogues are usually like the trap detectors and the disablers in the role-playing game. And in general, a rogue should have the ability to try to prevent a trap from setting off uh, before it has a chance to do anything. So, what I had said is that if a player is controlling the rogue, and the, the rogue player uh, flips over an encounter card that ends up being a trap card, then they can immediately attempt a disarm roll to prevent it from going off in the first place. Just makes, again, the rogue make sense. And if you have a rogue with the Thieves Tool item, then you actually disarm a trap on a roll of five or higher, which is really cool. But again, it just felt like it made the rogues feel more like their role-playing counterpart, meaning that they could disable a trap before it goes off. If any of the other players, however, flips over a trap card, then, well, that's it. They end up setting off the trap card. 
Uh, the other thing that I wanted to kind of address is uh, hit points and health. Uh, and again, you know, the fact that it can be a very lethal game. So the other house rule that I had made up personally was that whenever a hero gains second level, they also get heal hit points equal to their healing surge value. So it just, again, heals them back up uh, as they gain a level. Because generally speaking, when you gain a level, you end up being at full hit points anyway. This way, you at least heal up a little bit. So those are sort of my thoughts on the uh, Castle Ravenloft game as well as the D&D cooperative board game system in general. Uh, now they did make changes with each of the subsequent uh, games that have been released and I do have the next two in the series. Uh, I didn't pick up Elemental Evil and at this point I don't really have any interest in picking up Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, simply from the standpoint that these are expensive board games and I haven't got a chance to play very many of them at all. So. Uh, for me, it's like spending $100 uh, Canadian after taxes and everything else on something that's just going to end up sitting on my shelf, similar to what's happening with Assault of the Giants. But if you'd like, I can do videos on the Wrath of a Shardalon game, as well as the Legend of Dritz game, because both of those games actually make some interesting changes to the uh, formula that was established in Castle Ravenloft. Uh, so again, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned a little bit about these cooperative board games. Uh, the next thing that I would like to do is actually go through and play uh, the single-player scenario. So each of these games has the first scenario in the rulebook being meant for only one player. It's sort of a way of whoever buys the game to be able to familiarize themselves with the way that it plays before having a group of people over. So. Uh, what I like to do is actually play that scenario out and have that as a separate video that's going to come out in the next couple of days. So until then, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and again, I hope you have a happy and safe Halloween, and we'll see you next time.